Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 14 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. If you're listening to this podcast, you're already in on the secret that there are many ways to be a historian in the world today, both inside and outside of the classroom. Thanks to the efforts of people all over the global village, it's more possible than ever before to follow the stories that interest you and to share these stories with the world in creative ways. For today's episode, I spoke with Christine Morgan, creator of Untitled History Project, a series of YouTube videos about history, which she created and launched when she was still finishing her graduate work. We talked about Melusine, the mysterious fairy who she's been working on lately, and her previous study of Mary Boleyn. But I think what you'll really want to hear is what she has to say about becoming a historian on her own terms. Here's my conversation with Christine about Melusine, Mary, and making it as a historian off the tenure track. Thanks, Christine, for joining us today on the podcast to talk about Melusine. I'm really excited to talk about this because this is a really great story. So tell us all about Melusine. Oh, my goodness. Where to begin? Uh, first of all, you are 100% correct. This is a great story. Um, and I, I'm so excited to be bringing Melusine to the forefront of the historic community uh, because I really believe that Melusine is foundational to the success of so many uh, royal women and noble women in medieval and then early modern Europe as well. So she's very special. Uh, and uh, what's even more incredible about Melusine is that she's not even real. So, <laughs> <laughs> or I guess you could debate me on that. <laughs> I know that uh, the medieval Europeans would. But it is quite remarkable because she shows up in this epic poem in 1393. We know that this poem is commissioned uh, specifically for the purpose of giving a duke in France um, a little more claim to his family territory. Uh, so it's propaganda to start with, and everyone knows it. And yet somehow this um, half woman, half serpent, fairy queen ends up being this genealogical icon um, and a sense of national pride. So if I were to just break it down really, really in a nutshell, why we get Melusine, uh, you could trace it to the very middle of the Hundred Years' War. And um, territory in France has just been reclaimed by Jean, Duke de Berry, from England who had been trying to lay claim to the area of Luxembourg and other areas for quite a long time. And so the Duke reclaims the territory and has to prove to his people that he is worthy of leading them. And that's going to require him to establish his bloodline. One of my favorite discussions in all of history is just bloodline. People get really weird with it, and it's so fun. Uh, and this is definitely one of those cases. So he, he commissions an epic poem to be written by um, Jean de Arras, and it's completed in 1393. And essentially, it does a couple of things. It uh, takes an oral tradition. Melusine certainly has Celtic roots, but it hashes out the story. It gives people names, and it places the characters and the characteristics of those characters with very real people. And it frames this mythological fairy woman within very real historic events. So it effectively muddies reality. And it's done so masterfully. And it addresses everything from why we shouldn't be afraid of this fairy in terms of her being maybe a demon, which is pretty traditional thought. But instead, uh, it frames her as a Christian woman who, uh, or a Christian fairy who marries a real man, a king, and then observes his Christian traditions. Uh, and because she observes those traditions, over time, she becomes more and more human. So we are able to see the Duke uh, find ways to trace genealogical lines into this mystical fairy woman and mythology. 
And significantly, he's tracing him his ties through a maternal line. That doesn't happen an awful lot, but it's so successful here that it would be really hard to not then trace its success and its roots to someone like, oh, I don't know, Henry Tudor, <laughs> who's also going to claim power through a maternal line. So this is a story that, as you say, has roots that go way back and really is kind of foundational in the identity of a couple of royal houses. So what royal houses are we talking about here? Well, it really does take root in uh, Luxembourg. We will see uh, later translations into Dutch. Uh, you can see some later translations um, even in uh, Asia. But I think probably the best use of it after Jean Duc de Berry is uh, Isabella and Ferdinand in Spain. And then later, uh, I would make an argument for the Tudors as well. Let's let's back it up and tell everyone who she was. So sure. she's this fairy. How does this come <laughs> into the story? She is uh, a triplet of fairy sisters. She comes from a fairy mother and a human father, supposed to be maybe the king of Scotland or something very similar. Um, so even the myth itself puts her in with a human entity. And uh, her curse is essentially that once um, a week she has to take a, a transformed figure where she becomes half serpent and then she remains half woman on top. She's very beautiful um, and she's very alluring and she meets her, her own Prince Charming at a fountain where she's bathing. So if you want to even kind of tie this with ideas of the Lady of the Lake, go ahead. Be my guest. Uh, very similar. So she is this mystical creature who has to bathe and take on this fairy serpent form once a week. And she marries a king, Raymondin, uh, with the agreement that he will not watch her bathe at this particular time of the week, or in some, some versions, it's time of the month or whatever it may be. And in return, she gives birth to 10 sons. <laughs> um, and they all have these really interesting physical deformities because they're half magical and half human. And so essentially the myth is that uh, they have this long relationship and one day he actually breaks his promise, walks in on her while she's bathing because he's been convinced that she's actually having an affair. Uh, so he walks in on her during her moment of transformation and it's downhill from there. And eventually he outs her to the kingdom or to his court, and she has to uh, turn into a flying serpent figure and fly away. And it's a fascinating story, and it's, it's taken many forms. Uh, definitely the original translations uh, put her as a half serpent, but it kind of develops into a more of a mermaid kind of a figure. I would say neither are are incorrect, but the serpent uh, is significant because it's not pretty and it's not um, delicate or feminine. So um, she's quite monstrous, actually. So it's a really weird juxtaposition between uh, the fairy world and the real world and then the royal family and uh, these sons who go on to fight in the Crusades and win all this territory and marry other princesses in Europe. Um, and then it turns out, you know, they're half magical. So it's a really interesting story. I think it's an interesting story as well, because you have a king or a duke or whoever it is in this version of the story who has made a promise that he's not going to spy on his wife. And it's mm -hmm. actually... Even though she is the supernatural being who's sort of monstrous, it's his fault. He's the one who actually breaks his oath and then bad things happen. And so mm -hmm. I think that's kind of interesting where even though she's the monstrous one, he's the oath breaker. And that's kind of a big deal. It is. And um, in the story, it's actually the downfall does start when he discovers her, but she's not forced into her fairy figure and banished from the kingdom until he outs her to the court. So there even was a moment where King Raymondin could have made good and kept her secret, but he doesn't. 
And that's where it, that's where the problem is. Yeah, it's a very Arthurian type story and it does have ties to Avalon and it's very, very old, as we said. Mm -hmm. And it has this, all these ideas that are in the Arthurian tradition where you have to follow what the fairies tell you or bad things will happen to you. <laughs> like I'm thinking of like Marie de France and her story of L'Enfant, who is, uh, you know, a knight who comes across a, a fairy who totally falls in love with him and, you know, she says, don't tell anyone about me and he does and then bad things happen <laughs> so yes it's funny how even though these are the f the fairy creatures there is a responsibility for the humans to be faithful to them that's right that's a really important piece of it so the existence of a fairy person in a christian life with any sort of power um, or influence is still heavily reliant upon not just the human but the man yeah exactly so I, I remember, and I might have this wrong, but I think that even the Angevins were talking about being the, the devil's brood and that they were derived, their family was derived from a Melusine <laughs> type story, weren't they as well? I think they were. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I think at that point, um, everybody was claiming it. <laughs> We're talking about men in this story and how the men are important, but there's actually a very important woman from history that has connections to Melusine, and that is Joan of Arc. So can you tell us what her connection is to the Melusine story? The Joan of Arc connection is incredible because when we talk about Rome, uh, excuse me, noble women, they really benefit from this myth. It helps them build their cities. It helps them look powerful and feminine. Um, but there's... Uh, a really interesting distinction where with Joan of Arc, she is actually put on trial in 1431, and part of her trial records actually entertains a line of questioning where they don't explicitly ac accuse her of witchcraft or association with Melusine in particular, but they ask her if she has done very specific types of activities in very specific types of places, which absolutely connect to the Melusine myth. For example, um, in Joan of Arc's hometown, there was something called the fairy tree. Um, and it's this great tree that grows next to a, a fountain. And the fountain is supposed to hold some sort of healing, magical healing abilities. Um, and so the people of the town go to the fairy tree and they dance and they offer, um, you know, garlands of flowers and they sing to honor the fairies who make the well medicinal. And there are a couple of ways that that ties into the Melusine myth, but Joan of Arc is specifically questioned, you know, how many times did you go to the fairy tree and how many times did you drink from the fountain? And Melusine is typically associated as being a water fairy, a water serpent and a water goddess. Um, and because she frequents fountains where she meets King Raymondin, the association with Joan going to the fountain, drinking from the fountain, and then dancing near the fountain can place you pretty squarely <laughs> into this Melusine myth. What I'm still trying to hash out is whether this was a class distinction, maybe the people who were questioning her weren't ready for a real world application of the myth. Maybe depending on your class, uh, it was possible for you to achieve power in the right way or achieve power in the wrong way. Uh, and for Joan, she clearly crossed that line. And it could have to do with uh, the real world application, the association with the fairy tree. Um, they also accuse her of, or question her rather, uh, did you go to the fairy tree at night? The idea of the nighttime being secretive or hiding the transformation of a fairy, uh, along with the fact that if she went at night, she would have been missing out on the religious activities in the city. <laughs> so they tie it all in. They uh, wrap it in a nice package and put a little bow on it uh, and deliver this really interesting tie between Joan of Arc and the Melusine myth. Yeah, I think that your idea of it being, of mythology being okay, depending on which class you're from, is an important one to bring up because 
uh, like we're saying, people are okay and even proud of being related to this mm -hmm. fairy, or in some cases, a demon, right? I think in the Angevin tradition, you know, she's she's a demon. And in the later French ones, she's a fairy. And that's okay if you are noble, and if it's far in the past, it's kind of <laughs> forgivable. But for somebody who is not noble, and for somebody, well, let's face it, they really had it out for Joan when they were interrogating mm. her. For someone who is a peasant, it's not okay to be <laughs> necessarily associating with fairies in the same way it's not as excusable. So I think you're onto something there. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it's really interesting that the fact that Bellicine is a Christian figure doesn't actually factor in here. In fact, they're using this idea of Joan worshiping fairies as an excuse to avoid Christian activity. So they're actually twisting it, which isn't surprising. It's not new. It's historically on brand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I just I feel for Joan because what if you grew up in this in this countryside where people idolized this figure and then you get to this point in your life where you're arguably one of the most successful women in history and this same story is used to demonize you. I feel for her. I do too. It's when I found her trial transcripts online and read them, you know, it was it was heartbreaking. It's it's hard to think about what Joan went through, especially when she was trying to untangle these things that to her were very were very Christian and she was not crossing that line, but to have that line be kind of blurred in a way that was meant to trap her. It's just it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. It, it is. 100%. You can't do history if you don't have empathy, and I definitely Man, Joan is one of those that just gets right to your heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that another thing that, that you're bringing up is really important as well, where I think that people really think that you had to separate Christianity and this idea of a, a mythical other world. And that wasn't necessarily the case in a lot of ways in that, you know, Arthur was considered a Christian king. He was taken away to Avalon. And lots of people believed in fairies and in Jesus at the same time. So it wasn't necessarily one or the other. But that being said, the 15th century was a dangerous time to be going around talking about talking to fairies. That would not be a good idea. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> So you were talking about Melusine possibly having a connection to the Tudors as well. So what brings you to the Tudors? The Tudors are really special because, well, actually, I think the Plantagenets actually kind of start the affiliation. But with Henry VII um, and then later Elizabeth I, there are some interesting things that they do or some interesting gifts that they receive that indicate personal belief or maybe even some more of that genealogical, you know, the best episode of who do you think you are, <laughs> <laughs> essentially. Uh, but with Elizabeth, the serpent figure actually makes its way into visuals with her. We see a serpent in two of her portraits, uh, whereas we don't necessarily see that um, quite so blatantly used in some of the other really powerful royal families. They kind of let the written word, the written propaganda do the work. But then with Elizabeth, who was so visual and so great with um, portraiture and fashion, um, and that was her propaganda, right? That's the beauty of the Tudor period. They're so visual. There was a, a portrait of Elizabeth I that was x-rayed, I think, back in 2010. And in the portrait where you could actually see it with your own eyes, it looks like she's holding a flower or a posy um, of some kind. But when they x-rayed it, what they actually saw was that the original painting had her holding a serpent. And that image had been changed. Again, you could, uh, you could try to figure out why. Maybe it was her being trying to be Christian and the serpent was having, you know, having a cultural problem at the time. You don't, I don't know. Yeah. But the original of it has her actually holding this uh, small, what it looks like a water snake. There are a couple of symbols that also pop up for Elizabeth because we know that she was a naval force to be reckoned with. 
And the serpent, uh, in association with Melusine, also tends to pop up in societies during times of expansion. What's significant about the x-ray of this particular portrait is that it's dated between the 1580s and the 1590s, which is also very specifically when Queen Elizabeth sends um, some groups out to Roanoke Island to start colonizing. So there's an expansion effort at this period when she's painted holding this serpent. It's a really interesting coincidence. Um, and then, of course, Roanoke Island fails miserably. Uh, <laughs> we, may never, we may never know what happened to those poor people who got stuck colonizing an island with no food. <laughs> but, you know, was it the failure that made them change the painting? Was it a cultural shift that made them change the painting? We don't know. But we do know what the original was. <laughs> Serpents are so interesting. They have so many meanings. I want to come back to the Tudors again in a second, but I think that we should let people know they are probably familiar with Melusine in terms of a symbol already without even knowing it. So where do people come across Melusine every day? Every single day on your morning cup of magical Joe. <laughs> <laughs> If you are a patron of the Starbucks company, you see Melusine every single day on your cup. She uh, welcomes you to your bright new morning, and she gets you through your two o'clock slump, and she does it with grace. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. With her, with her mermaid tail and her beautiful hair, Melusine Absolutely. is everywhere. She's everywhere. Now, I would like to also point out, just for the fun of it, the original Melusine has one tail, so the Starbucks logo is very sexual. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can cut that out if you want. But <laughs> it's kind of a fun trivia piece. <laughs> nope, nope, we're leaving that in because oh, no one is going to look at their Starbucks cup the same <laughs> way again. you like, look at that two-tailed mermaid. <laughs> That's right. You're welcome, yeah. everybody. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but you're working on Melusine right now, but you're kind of uh, a newcomer to the Middle Ages in some ways because you are a Tudor scholar and your work was mostly on Mary Boleyn. So what work did you do on Mary? Mm. So my, my purpose of working with Mary is kind of similar to my purpose of working with Melusine. So I think I'm figuring out what my trajectory kind of looks like as an historian. And I chose Mary because uh, I have an affinity for women who get erased, who probably had a much bigger role in the world as we know it, and somehow have just not made it into the history books. So with Mary, I did a lot of exploration into her role during uh, the Reformation in particular. So again, I really enjoy looking at the religious aspects of these stories, these women. Uh, and then on top of it, we're kind of trying to figure out, is the narrative of, of Mary accurate if we say she's the other Boleyn girl? Or is it possible that she had some of her own agency and gumption and uh, power at court? Uh, and for me, the answer is yes to that. <laughs> so you think she is the Boleyn girl? <laughs> mm. I don't know. It's really hard to, to top Anne, but uh, I would say if you make it through the Tudor period as a Boleyn and your head is still attached, you're probably one of the more successful ones. Yeah. <laughs> that is a very, <laughs> very good point. So uh -huh. speaking of Mary's erasure, I was one of the many people who didn't know about Mary Boleyn before Philippa Gregory. So what do you think about bringing these women forward that have been forgotten by history, bringing them forward in fiction. What do you think that does? Do you think that's helpful? Do you think it's complicated? <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> that's their status. Um, gosh, this is, this is a really great question. And I think it's one of those things that kind of gets cycled through every once in a while. For me personally, I'm very grateful for Philippa Gregory. Um, I would say probably some of my own sparks of interest um, between Mary and Melusine are going to come from reading a work of fiction that is incredibly well done. But then you, you look at that and you go, okay, well, how much of that was true? 
And then you're down the rabbit hole. So uh, for me, you could consider Philippa Gregory an excellent fiction writer, but she does great research and she frames women really beautifully. Um, I read a great article one time about how historical fiction can almost be, you know, like a, a move of feminism. I, I don't know if I'd go that far, but I do love seeing these these new platforms for these women that you wouldn't find really anywhere else or can't can't find anywhere else. So I'm grateful because uh, it started with entertainment and then it snowballed. And I don't think that my story is very different from any other, you know, person who would like to become a, a historian, uh, you know, or, or an amateur historian, someone who does it for fun, because the reality is there's a lot of fun to be had. So when you start with entertainment and then move into reality and questions and curiosity, I think it's a beautiful process and uh, I'm grateful for it. I love that. I love that. And I don't think your story is much like anyone else's because you like bringing together history and entertainment and you've done that really consciously from an early point in your academic career. And so that's something I want to talk about. One of the reasons I brought you on is because you're kind of like me in that you're a rebel historian and <laughs> that you're taking on history outside of the academy. And so for you, you did it with uh, the Untitled History Project. So can you tell us a little bit about what the Untitled History Project is and how it came about and how you started it? Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, I think in my, in my quest for entertaining history, um, you know, you can always find a good book, but man, is it hard to find a, a good video. There are excellent documentaries, but if you're just, you know, on the internet and you're looking for something fun and quick and exciting but also accurate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. there's, there's only a handful of things to choose from. Um, and so for me, I decided to fill a niche that I wanted to exist. I wanted it for myself and I figured I can't possibly be alone. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so I just sort of, um, I dipped my toe into the YouTube world and it was incredibly successful. Uh, I've had some really excellent response. Uh, my first season, I kind of spread out different topics. I think I, I started with Queen Charlotte because I'm in Charlotte. It seemed really appropriate for me to start that way. But my second season, I really focused in on the Tudors from start to finish, uh, how they got there, what are the best unsolved mysteries, um, what are the best and worst relationships? You know, um, there's maybe some opinion in interjected there, but I really do try to present factual information with visuals. I like to direct people towards the fact that there's some really great manuscripts and documents that you can find online. You don't have to be in an archive to do excellent research. And I think it's powerful and liberating for those who like to educate themselves, to have something really quick and fun. The videos I've made uh, have been used in schools, which is a huge honor. I am just absolutely floored by that. I never expected that when I started. But at the same time, I'm really trying to break down the stigma that you have to have a certain background and a certain amount of resources to find your great stories, because it's not true. Archives have been so diligent about digitizing. And there's just some great stuff that you can find out there that will help you answer your own questions. So I want people to be empowered, but I want them to be entertained at the same time. I think we can accomplish that as historians. <laughs> I think that's something that we can do. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. So that it was a conscious decision that you made to not follow that PhD, that tenure track path. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say to other people that are looking down that road and trying to decide what they should do? What, what do you think you should say to them? I think I would really encourage people to think outside the box. Non-academic history is completely possible. Uh, and especially here in North America, I just want to point out there's a huge audience for it. 
that um, is really difficult to tap into in terms of getting a larger platform. But if you can find your people, <laughs> right, find your history friends in alternative ways, you're going to see a support system that is, I mean, it's going to blow your mind. So think outside of the box. If you want that PhD, go get that PhD. That's a great thing. But if you're just if you're thinking about it and you think you've got something to contribute and you're just bursting at the seams with creativity or with, you know, a real passion for communication, there are avenues now that will allow you to become a very credible historian as long as you're doing the legwork and you can get your message out in lots of different ways. That's awesome. And I really like the passion that you bring to that because it is so important. And I think that when people are looking at the academic job market, it can be very scary mm. to feel like you're on this this edge of something and not really know what to do with it. And you know you have this passion for history. What are you going to do with it? So I think it's great that you're really bringing this passion out to people because there are different ways to be a historian now, which is something that was not possible before. Yeah. So yeah, and huge shout out. I know it's kind of silly, but huge shout out to the Twitter community of historians. If you haven't gone there yet, do yourself a favor and uh, join the fun because it's it's incredible. Yeah, and when, when you were talking about the community of people that support you, I was immediately thinking about Twitter and mm -hmm. how on Twitter, you can have these superstars of history that are so supportive of people who are just starting out or who are doing it differently. And really, this is a great time to be a historian. And Twitter seems to be where it's at for that. <laughs> for that. I agree. I agree. All your listeners need to go join uh, Medieval Twitter and Twitter Storians. And yeah. oh, man, it's fun. Absolutely. And we'll give See them how your you Twitter. Can contribute. <laughs> yes. Yes. We'll give them your Twitter handle in a minute, too. So, are you going to do another uh, series of Untitled History Project? Is that stirring uh, in your mind? That's such a great question. <laughs> um, I would really love to. I think it needs to evolve a little bit. I am playing with what that looks like. Um, like I said, there is. Um, there's a massive community that loves medieval and early modern history. Uh, the tutors are perennial. Uh, and then you throw in myths and magic, and it's great. But, you know, I see other um, glimmers of need. And I think if I were to do a season three, I think I would have to go American history. Wow, nice. I think I would have to. You know, I realize even as an American – just how terrible my understanding of it was. <laughs> um, or the things that people told me were the most important things. And this is true of all history. When you look at it and then you start asking questions about how it started, you realize the roots go much further. And American history is so uniquely tied to British history or UK history as well. So there's some really interesting things there. And I'm just, I'm mulling it over. Awesome. Well, we will definitely look forward to that. And I was thinking, you know, this is another brilliant thing about about being a rebel historian is you don't necessarily have to be tied to one period, which is, right. <laughs> there's something to be said the, for that. I can go where the wind takes me uh, <laughs> and just hope that people are entertained enough to just come along for the ride. Yes. Well, I'm so happy you came along for the ride today and joined us on the podcast. Thank you so much, Christine. I am so thrilled to have been here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. To find out more about Christine's work, you can follow her on Twitter at Ms. Christine Mo. That's M-S Christine M-O. Or you can follow Untitled History Project on Facebook. You can read her article on Melusine in the March 2019 issue of the Medieval Magazine. And you can watch all of Christine's videos by visiting Untitled History Project on YouTube. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? 
Hi, Danielle. Uh, first thing I want to do is uh, thank everyone that's actually uh, signed up for our Patreon page. Uh, we've got about a dozen people already. That's kind of it's really great for our first week that have decided to kind of support us. And, and I'm, I'm really thankful that you're enjoying your content and this is what you uh, want to kind of support. So first of all, thank you. Second of all, what's new on the website? Uh, we've uh, brought in a new columnist. His name is George Theotokis and his expertise is in the Byzantine history. Uh, so you can see uh, his kind of first official column. Uh, he's kind of written a couple pieces before for us, but this is his first official column, and it looks at the aftermath of the Battle of Manzikert in the 11th century. Uh, so you can read about that. You can read more about the Albigensian Crusade, and we've got also uh, an interesting little piece on physicians in the Middle Ages. So all that was kind of uh, up on the website uh, this week. Thanks, Peter. You're welcome. As Peter mentioned, we are exceptionally grateful to the patrons who have already signed up to support us on Patreon, some of whom will soon be getting the first issue in their subscriptions to Medieval Warfare magazine as a thank you. If you'd like to get in on those goodies and support the podcast, you can find us at patreon.com slash medievalists. Being a medievalist off the tenure track isn't always easy, so we're grateful every single day for your support, whether it's subscribing to the podcast, leaving us a rating, or becoming a patron. All of these things are helpful, and all of these things are most appreciated. If you love Medievalists.net, come and join our community on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can also follow me, Danielle Sabalski, on all your favorite social media platforms at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. You can even read my books if you like, The 5 Minute Medievalist and The 5 Minute Medievalist's Guide to Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse by picking up a copy from Amazon. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thank you so much for supporting this rebel historian and Medievalists.net. Have yourself an awesome day. Thank you.